So this is the second lecture covering the basic theory of elliptic curves. So in this talk, we'll first introduce the notion of height and uh, which is actually needed also in the proof of model well theorem. And also I'll define the regulator in the context of elliptic curves. We already saw, uh, Mayesh mentioned the regulator in the context of Gisley class number formula. So we'll discuss that a bit. And then the finally, we'll talk about elliptic curves over complex numbers and their association with lattices. Okay, so as I said, this notion of height will be useful to us in the context of proving the model wheel theorem. And we'll also use it to define the regulator, which is kind of a volume element associated with the model wheel group of an elliptic curve over a number field. And uh, the basic reference will be Silverman's book on arithmetic of elliptic curves for this part of the talk. Okay, so, so roughly speaking, the height, what does it say? The height of a rational point, it measures how complicated the point is from the viewpoint of number theory. I've just quoted Silverman here from his book. So, so what is the basic notion? Maybe it is best to understand it for rational numbers, although this notion extends to number fields. So let's just first see it for uh, rational numbers. So suppose we have a rational number m by n in its lowest form. So we can define its height as the maximum of the numerator and the denominator in absolute terms. So for example, height of one is one, but height of 999 by 1000, it is actually 1000. So in some sense, this fraction is uh, more complicated than one. Okay, that is the uh, idea. And it is quite easy to observe that if we have any real number B, then the set of rational points of bounded height is finite. Okay, and uh, so we, want to use this for points on the elliptic curve as well. And for that, what you can do, if we have a point, a rational point defined on an elliptic curve over Q, then we can define its height with just the height of the X coordinate, which we have already defined for rational numbers. When this point is not a point at infinity, okay? because they are, of course, X and Y are infinite, so, I mean, I mean, for that we define it separately, it is one. The height of the point at infinity is defined to be one. And to define it over number fields, one has to work a bit because we uh, one has to involve all the places. Uh, or in fact, this can be defined for projective and space first. Okay, so points in a projective space over a number field, we can take the homogeneous coordinates and then we take uh, the uh, norm at each place V, and then we take the maximum of them, and then we finally take the product. So it is somewhat more involved, but just keeping in mind the height for rational numbers, we can understand the main uh, points. So I'm just skipping the details regarding heights of uh, for um, number fields, element from a number field. But of course, all. All these things are explained in detail in the book, Arithmetic of Elliptic Curves in chapter eight. So, but it is more convenient to go to a logarithmic height so that we can compare the height of P plus Q to height of P and height of Q. So rather than the capital H that we used, it's often better to take the logarithmic height and uh, so this logarithmic height is defined as you take the capital height and then you take the log of it. Okay. So, and of course this height will also have this kind of finiteness condition. So if we have an elliptic curve over a number field, and if we have, if we are given any real number B, then the set of points on the elliptic curve of bounded height or height bounded by B, is finite. And secondly, we can see how the height of P plus P naught compares with height of P. So that's a, uh, that in fact, there is a constant 
depending on the elliptic curve E and a fixed point P naught such so that the height of P plus P naught is less than equal to two times of height of P plus C naught. In other words, it compares nicely height of P plus P naught and twice the height of P, it compares nicely. And another property is that uh, if we add P to itself, how does the heights compare? Okay, even then, this uh, nice behavior that height of 2p is like height, uh, four times height of p. So it's like almost like quadratic in nature. Okay, we can see that like uh, from this, in fact, one can see that if we multiply a point p n times, then height will be multiplied almost like n squared times. Although it's not quite exact, but the uh, uh, behavior is like that. So. So you can see that a logarithmic height function, it behaves like a quadratic function. Okay. So height of n times p and n square of height of p, they are like bounded. This difference is bounded. And one would like to get rid of this uh, bounded term. Okay. And one can do that using what is known as this canonical height. Okay. So in fact, we get a quadratic form which will differ from this logarithmic height by a bounded amount. Okay. So in fact, this logarithmic height, which uh, almost behaves like a quadratic function, from there, we can get another height known as this canonical height, which is, uh, th these two will differ by a bounded, amou bounded amount, but the canonical one will behave like a quadratic form. Okay, so, so it will be, defined like this. So how we define it? It is like we take this limit of this sequence 4 to the power minus n height of 2n times p. And because of the properties in the first three lemmas or the lemma 2 and lemma 3, we can show that this is actually a Cauchy sequence and then it is uh, it approaches some limit and this uh, this gives us the canonical height. Okay. And this uh, canonical height has nice properties, which we'll also use in proving the model well theorem. That this is known as the parallelogram law, that if we have two points on the elliptic curve, and if we compare the heights of P plus Q and P minus Q, then it is like two times height of P and two times height of Q. So this is, this is quite useful. And secondly, as we said, it will be like a quadratic form that height of NP is N square times height of P. And we get what is known as the height pairing that we take all the points on the elliptic curve defined, uh, defined over its algebraic closure. And then we get a pairing through this canonical height that the sparing of P and Q, the value is height of P plus Q minus height of Q minus, minus height of Q. So this actually gives us a pairing. And this pairing will appear like when we, like in the Hignar point, like to show that uh, from the Hignar point, we are getting a point of infinite order. Uh, this pairing is also uh, useful because gross formula gives uh, uh, <clears throat> the canonical height of the Higner point that we get and that turns out to be non-torsion if the height is non-zero because canonical height is property that it is always non-negative of course but it is zero if and only if it's a torsion point so if we want to show that some point is okay so there's some uh, okay just a moment yeah Mm -hmm. There is a question, I suppose. Okay, sorry, I'm not. Getting... Sorry, there's a question by Dittajit, but I'm not sure yeah. how to unmute. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so in the point number B here, you have written that h hat of np equals to n squared time h hat of p. So isn't there uh, a constant term, uh, error term like that in, 
that oh, it, no, you, one can get rid of that actually when we take the canonical height oh all right okay, okay. that is a, one of the purpose of this canonical height okay okay, okay. so somehow the chat box i cannot easily locate so maybe anyway i can answer the questions at the end of the lectures i mean i'll try to address okay so yeah so this property t is also quite useful that from the height itself we will know whether the point is torsion or non torsion and as i said uh, in gross zegier formula for the higner point that this uh, height of this canonical height of the higner point is shown to be the derivative of the l function so that uh, if the derivative is non zero then one gets a non torsion point so in that context so canonical height is quite useful this is just to give the impression that this is a very useful notion and property e is that this logarithmic height that we dis uh, uh, discussed or introduced earlier and this canonical height they differ by a bounded amount and the, the uh, <coughs> sorry and the final property is that actually this is uniquely defined because if we assume all these properties for any function then it has to be i mean there's only one function satisfying all these five properties so it has to be the one that we defined previously okay because this one this the way we have defined this actually satisfies all these properties but on the other hand no other function satisfies this so to speak okay so and yeah some of these properties follow by induction and basically we just use those uh, properties lemma 2 3 lemma 2 and 3 and uh, to get all these properties to prove all these properties okay so now let's move on to the second part of the talk which is the sketch of the proof of model rail theorem okay and to do that there's two parts first the weak model rail theorem so what is the model rail theorem It says that if we have an electric curve over a number field then we know that the k rational point on the elliptic curve b is a finitely generated abelian group and it has some copies of uh, i mean we have to show that basically that uh, that's a finitely generated abelian group so first what we have is the weak weak version of this theorem that if we take the quotient of the k rational points on elliptic curve e and mod out by twice that then it is finite okay so we'll assume this but this uh, weak model will theorem how is it proved that it can be we can show that this quotient can be embedded in a galois cohomology group okay h1 of the absolute galois group of k which e2 and then it and this uh, it will it will be contained in a subgroup which con, uh, contains cohomology classes that satisfy certain local conditions in other words it will be actually contained in a selmer group but since uh, sudanshu will talk in detail about selmer groups so i'll skip this in other words this finiteness of this quotient will follow from finiteness of the two selmer group and two is not nothing special uh, so if we quotient by any uh, other in, uh, other natural number also ek by mek that will also be finite okay but two will also suffice so so in order to prove the model will theorem which is recall these properties of the canonical height that height of 2p is 4 times height of p and secondly this finiteness finiteness condition that given an elliptic curve over a number field that the k rational points of bounded height that is finite and this finiteness one can deduce from the finiteness of the logarithmic height because the logarithmic height and this canonical height they are just uh, like they differ by a bounded amount so one can get this okay so we'll uh, we can use these two properties to show that model will group is finitely generated okay so how do we prove it so let me just sketch give the sketch of the proof so let's first take this quotient q1 q2 up to qk of ek mod 2ek 
because by the weak model will theorem it is finite okay and then we'll take b to be the maximum height maximum canonical height for this uh, representatives okay then what will be our candidate for the generating set we'll take the set s on the elliptic curve such that their height is less than b where b is the maximum of the height of the representatives and then we can we claim that this set actually generates ek so how do we show this that suppose if possible it does not generate then there will be the complement will be non empty so let u be the complement in the modulo group of this subgroup generated by this set s of bounded height okay so since this set is non empty there will be a point of least canonical height why this point exists because we know that uh, less than a given height there are only finitely many points so if we pick any point from u and consider its height then there will be only finitely many which will ha have uh, less height than this so we can always pick the smallest one the one in the complement of smallest height and our idea is to show that this will lead to a contradiction okay so yeah so existence of such a point in the complement is guaranteed if we assume the non emptiness because of the finiteness property of this canonical height okay so now this point r we can write because this is the point of smallest height so we can write it as some representative qi plus twice a point on ek okay because we because qi they form a set of representatives for ek mod 2 ek so we take a representative and then we take an element from the subgroup 2 ek so we can write r as qi plus 2p okay and we observe that qi clearly belongs to the set s so certainly it belongs to the subgroup generated by s whereas r does not belong to the subgroup generated by s hence p will also not belong to the subgroup generated by s okay then we'll just show that height of p in such a situation has to be smaller than okay so okay so so let's see so how do we prove it like we just use a parallelogram law that we know that two times height of r plus two times height of qi is height of r plus qi plus height of r minus qi okay so we just have to uh, work with this and then we observe that two times height of qi is height of r plus qi and height of 2p because r minus qi is 2p minus twice the height of r and since height of any point is non negative so we get this inequality and we observe that height of 2p is four times height of p and coming out of all this is that we find that height of r is less than height of uh, height of qi okay so in other words it's just a calculation with height okay which gives us a contradiction because we get a point of lesser height in the complement okay so this is the idea of the model will theorem using canonical height okay so next we talk about talk a little bit about the regulator of an elliptic curve okay so it's an important arithmetic invariant which we can compare with the regulator of a number field that mahesh also talked about in the context of units okay so how do we define the regulator because with the model will theorem we know that ek tensor with r it's a finite dimensional vector space over r and we can think of ek quotiented out by these torsion points as a lattice 
and this regulator we can think of as the volume of this fundamental domain of that lattice okay so it's like the volume of the fundamental lattice ek quotiented by ek torus and this volume is calculated with respect to the neurontet height pairing or the canonical height pairing that we mentioned okay so how does it work out suppose is at a generate generators p1 up to p1 p2 pr let them be the generators of ek mod ek tors then the regulator is defined as the determinant of the matrix which is formed by taking this pairing of these points of infinite order so this is the regulator okay and uh so how can we see this importance of this regulator mahesh already mentioned this analytic class number formula of drisley that it gives the residue of the dirichlet zeta function of a number field k at the pole s equal to 1 in terms of other arithmetic invariants associated with the number field like the roots of unity and the class number the discriminant and the regulator of the number field so this formula we just saw in the previous lecture as well that this class number we can express in terms of the residue and the, but this formula involves a regulator term and this regulator is coming from the units in the ring of integers of k it's like again a volume element calculated in some uh, minkowski space okay so the same thing we can see in the bsd conjecture also that is uh, the second part of the bsd conjecture that will be certainly discussed later and i will also briefly mention in my third lecture that the bsd conjecture there is a formula analog a similar formula for the l function of an elliptic curve that expresses the value of the l function at s equal to 1 in terms of certain arithmetic invariants what are those invariants in this context it's like the local tamagawa numbers the order of the shafarevi state group the number of points torsion points on the elliptic curve and uh, a period and together with the regulator so this regulator makes its appearance there but but uh, in sudangsu's lecture he'll be talking about shafarevi state group as well so we'll see some of these terms uh, later but this is just to give you some idea that uh, so the first the point of this first two point is i mean first two sections of this talk is that this notion of canonical height is useful not just in proving model well theorem but also in defining this term of regulator and also to identify non torsion points if we can express the canonical height of a point in terms of something which is non vanishing then we can say that the point is of infinite order okay so these are the main things that we want to highlight in this first part of the talk and then in the second part i'll talk about elliptic curves over complex numbers okay so to do that first let's talk a little bit about lattices in uh, complex numbers Just before that, I think uh, there was one more question from Shyam Sen Gupta. Uh, does this theory develop some relation between torsion points of elliptic curves and roots of unity in number fields? Probably with the help of the regulator. Yeah, probably. Yeah, because in the, at least in the formula wise, okay. So I mean, if if, if we we can draw an analogy like this regulator in place of this regulator, we have the elliptic curve regulator. I'm oh, sorry. and then the place of this roots of unity we have the torsion points on the elliptic curve so that way yeah so we can say that kind of plays an analogous role okay so so what is a lattice in the complex field it's a group consisting of elements which are integral linear combinations of two non zero complex numbers W one and W two, where W one is not a real multiple of W two. So in simple terms, we just Z W one plus Z W two, or the set M W one plus M W two, 
but m and n are integers and omega uh, this uh, w1 and w2 they are not uh, like uh, linearly dependent over r okay. so i mean uh, w1 and w2 over r they will span complex numbers okay so this is a lattice and so if we look at the quotient that if we look at the quotient of c by a lattice we'll see that it's like a torus because we can take just a parallelogram here and then its opposite sides are also identified so that it gives us a torus and which has genus 1 topological genus 1 and what we want to show is that this c mod lambda is isomorphic to a lattice and c mod lambda is isomorphic to an elliptic curve so so basically we want to see an zero association between lattice and elliptic curves over c okay and in order to do that we have to define some function from c mod lambda in other words and to define functions on c mod lambda we need certain functions which are invariant under translations by lambda so in other words what we need is elliptic functions so what is an elliptic function if we have we if we have a lattice lambda then this elliptic function relative to this lambda it's a meromorphic function on c which is invariant under translations by the lattice elements okay and for convenience we denote the set of all elliptic functions by c lambda and it's clearly it's a field and we can think of it as a function on the quotient group and it follows from liouville's theorem that that an elliptic function which no poles or no zeros must be constant because liouville's theorem says that an um, analytic function on c it has to be i mean an entire function is constant okay so Uh, so this uh, follows from Liouville's theorem that analytic and bounded function it is must be constant. Okay, so so first we try to construct some functions and uh, from some ellipt elliptic functions. So the first one is like this Weierstrass-Fick function. So how is this defined? This Weierstrass-Fick function with respect to a lattice lambda it is given by this sum this infinite sum that is 1 by z square then you sum over the non zero lattice elements 1 minus uh, 1 by z minus omega square minus 1 by omega square so this one can show that this actually converges absolutely and uniformly on every complex subset of c minus lambda and clearly it is even and it is meromorphic and it has a double pole which residue zero at each lattice point and no other poles so all these details are there in silverman's book so i'm just mentioning some key points here that this function first of all it is uh, a meromorphic function then of course we want to show that it is elliptic to show that it is elliptic function then let's look at its derivative so if we differentiate term by term which you can do at uh, away from the lattice points and we find that the derivative appears like that so clearly this derivative is certainly elliptic because if we translate by lattice elements it is invariant okay and then if we integrate the derivative then we find that we'll have some constant term but this constant term has to be zero because if we simply evaluate it at minus omega by 2 then we find that because of evenness of the weierstrass p function that the value at omega by 2 and minus omega by 2 they have to be equal and in other words it's basically in other words it simply follows or it's trivial to show that this weierstrass p function is elliptic so we have two elliptic functions uh, p and its derivative and actually these two are enough because one can show that every elliptic function is a rational combination of these two so given a lattice we essentially did this weierstrass p function and together with its derivative 
any other elliptic function it's just a rational combination of these okay but to uh, to get the map from c mod lambda to an elliptic curve we need to relate because uh, we'll see that this pz and p dash z they satisfy an algebraic equation which will be cubic in p and quadratic in p dash in other words it will be of the form y square equal to x cube plus x plus b form okay so to do that we just need to look at these expansions of pz and p dash z we we'll look at their lorentz series of pz which is given by this expression which involves this eigenstein series of weight 2k plus 2 so what is this eigenstein series for a lattice lambda the eigenstein series is like you take all these even powers of the lattice non zero lattice points and then it converges for uh, k bigger than 1 and then this uh, gives you this uh, lorentz series expansion of pz and similarly one can obtain this for p dash z and then compare and see that this p dash z square is nothing but 4 pz cube minus z2 pz minus z3 so what are these z2 and z3 they can be expressed in terms of these multiples of this eigenstein series okay uh, and there's one more question in the chat uh, is the yeah. field of elliptic function same as the field of meromorphic functions of the riemann surface c mod lambda yeah i think so 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 now to be an elliptic curve what we need so if we have y square equal to cubic we want uh, this cubic not to have repeated roots because for the sake of non singularity this should not have any repeated roots that can also be shown actually that uh, this z2 and since this coefficient this leading coefficient is not uh, one but it is four so the discriminant will be slightly modified and it will be enough to show that z2 cube minus 27 z3 square is non zero and one can show that in other words starting with a lattice we look at the quotient c mod lambda then we take the weight stress p function and its derivative then these two functions will satisfy this equation so in other words they will give us complex points because this pz and p dash z will give us complex points on an elliptic curve whose equation will be of the form y square equal to 4x cube minus, uh, minus z2x minus z3 okay they will be defined over c so starting with the lattice we arrive at an elliptic curve and so this is the map like we have the c mod lambda and we are mapping to the, the complex points on an elliptic curve by this map okay so putting it in this form actually takes care of the fact that at the lattice points we have poles like z will have pole of order 2 and p dash z will have pole of order 3 so it will actually correspond to the point at infinity the lattice points will get mapped to 0 1 0 because the pole of p dash z will be of order 3 whereas pole of p z will be of order 2 okay so And that's what we want. We want this zero to go to zero. I mean, this, this map will actually send lattice points, which are actually the zero element in the quotient. We go to the point at infinity on the elliptic curve. And one can in fact show that this is also a group isomorphism. Okay. So in other words, if we, uh, we if we take the sum of z one and z two in C mod lambda, and then we map it, that it will go to sum of the points on the elliptic curve that we define in my first lecture that we know that two points in the elliptic curve we can add them so it's like a group homomorphism and there are many ways to show this homomorphism one way is to construct a suitable function on c mod lambda with z z1 plus z2 minus z1 minus z2 plus o as divisors and that construction uses wister sigma function and for details of course silverman's book is there but there are other ways to show this also like one can take the difference of 
Wester's function evaluated at z1 plus z2 and subtract like pz1 minus uh, p dash z1 minus p dash z2 by pz1 minus pz2 etc. This addition formula, I mean, and we can use Liouville's theorem also. That we are getting an elliptic function with no poles. Okay, if we take the difference, that way also one can show. But in other in, in any case, this is a group a group homomorphism. And how do we show the surjectivity? It follows from this fact that the pz minus x is a non-constant non function, non-constant elliptic function. So anyway, so this is actually giving us an isomorphism, group isomorphism. And what about the inverse? The inverse one can get by integrating from a fixed point to an arbitrary point, this invariant differential 2x, uh, sorry, dx by 2y. But yeah, we don't have to bother about all these details. Just I'm just giving you some rough idea that uh, there's also an inverse map. And this integral, although it is path dependent, but modulo the lattice elements, it will be independent of the path. Okay, so that's how we get a inverse map also. So this C mod lambda and this elliptic curve, they are isomorphic as groups. Okay. So given a lattice, we are associating it with an elliptic curve, but we want to do the converse also. Suppose we are starting with an elliptic curve over C. How do I find a lattice lambda such that C mod lambda is giving us that elliptic curve? Okay. So starting with a lattice, starting with a lattice, we get an elliptic curve, but starting with an elliptic curve, we should get a lattice. And that can also be done using this uh, uniform uniformization theorem, which says that if we have uh, complex numbers such that a cube minus 27 b square is non-zero, then there exists a lattice such that this Eisenstein series has the value a by 60 and b by 160. Okay, or maybe it was 40. Anyway, doesn't matter, I mean, whether I got this constants. Let me just check once whether I got the constants right. Yeah, okay, fine, 60 and 140. Okay, so this is not 160, it is 140, sorry. Okay, so, so given an elliptic curve, we can always put it in this form, y square equal to 4x cube minus ax minus b, because we are in complex field. And for that, we'll have a cube minus 27b square is non-zero. Okay. And whenever we have that for complex numbers A and B, then we can find a lattice such that this Z2 is A and Z3 is B. Okay. And this proof uses the surjectivity of this modular function, that this Z function from upper half plane to complex numbers. Okay. So it essentially follows from that, but we don't worry about the details here. Okay, so the set of lattices in complex numbers and the set of elliptic curves defined over C, they have a one to one correspondence. And one upshot is that now we can easily see what should be the n torsion points defined over the complex field for any elliptic curve. It has to be Zn times Zn because that is the torsion point of C mod lambda. It's quite it can be easily seen that in C mod lambda, the n torsion points are Zn times Zn. Okay. So that will be the case for torsion points defined over complex field. But of course, when we have a number field or we have rational field, then we will not get all the torsion points over the base field. Okay. For that, of course, we have Mazur's theorem for um, the base field Q and some uh, for, uh, number fields of a small small degree, we have some other uh, results like that. Okay, now this association, can we make it more precise? Suppose two elliptic curves are isomorphic. How will it get reflected in the, in the case of lattices? Or in the, what sense two lattices should be related so that we get isomorphic elliptic curves? Okay, for that, what we 
point is that if two lattices are homothetic, then corresponding elliptic curves will be isomorphic. So what do we mean by homothetic lattices? So two lattices, lambda one and lambda two, in the field of complex numbers, they are called homothetic. If there exists a non-zero complex number alpha, such that alpha lambda one is lambda two. Okay. So if we have this, then we can define a map for this quotient, C mod lambda one to C mod lambda two, simply by multiplying with alpha. Like if we have any complex number z mod lambda one, we multiply by alpha and we get alpha z, and certainly points in lambda one goes to points in lambda two. Okay, and by multiplying by alpha inverse, we can get an inverse also. So we get this map, but we know that C mod lambda one is like corresponding to an elliptic curve E lambda one, and C mod lambda two is cor corresponds to an elliptic curve E lambda two. So at the level of elliptic curve, basically we will be getting a map where this this Weierstrass p function and its derivative with respect to lambda one will get mapped to the corresponding elements with respect to lambda two. Okay, and this map one can show is an isomorphism of elliptic curves. Okay, so and what is essential here is to realize that. The Weierstrass function p of alpha z with respect to lambda two is in fact elliptic with respect to lambda one, so that it's a rational expression in terms of p and p dash of the lattice lambda one. Okay, so we, as we know that this what are morphisms between curves like they are they should be given by in terms of polynomials or rational functions. Okay. So that's the essence of this one-to-one -one correspondence. That lattices in C up to homotety, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with elliptic curves over C up to isomorphism. Okay. And in this context, one can also say that suppose we have alpha of lambda one contained in lambda two, then at the level of elliptic curves, we'll be getting an isogeny. Okay. We may not get an isomorphism. But we'll get an isogeny. Okay. So now, so if we can understand this space a bit better, the lattices in C up to homotety, if we have a good set of representatives, then we'll have a good set of representatives for elliptic curves over C up to isomorphism. So let's see, uh, lattices in C up to homotety, do we have a good representative set? And for that, we go to the complex upper half plane. So let's take the complex upper half plane. So it consists of all the complex numbers with uh, imaginary part bigger than zero. Okay. And then for such a complex number, we have the lattice lambda tau. For any tau in the upper half plane, we can get a lattice lambda tau, which is z tau plus z. Okay, so first we observe that if we start with any lattice, any two basis elements, omega one and omega two, then what happens? Since they are not real multiples of one another, their imaginary part will be non-zero, and at least one of them will have positive imaginary part, either omega two by omega one or omega one by omega two. Their imaginary part will be positive. So let's say omega one by omega two is positive. It has positive imaginary part. Okay. Then we can see that the lattice that we started with, we will find a homothetic lattice lambda tau. Okay. In other words, we can always pick a lattice of the form lambda tau in any homothetic class. So that is one simplification. That uh, that we don't have to look at arbitrary elements omega one and omega two, but we can always take one comma tau as the basis for the lattice in a homotetic class. 
Okay, but we can further check that whether we can reduce this representative set because we will not need all these lambda towns. Okay, because there is an SL to Z action on the upper half plane. So suppose we have two elements tau and tau dash in the upper half plane, and we'll have two lattices lambda tau and lambda tau dash. Okay, and suppose they are homotetic. Then what we want to say is that in that case, tau dash will be a tau plus b by c tau plus d for some element a b c d in SL two Z of two by two matrices of determinant one with integer coefficients. Okay. And this is also quite trivial to show because first of all, let's say we have two elements in the upper half plane, tau prime and tau, such that tau prime is the image of tau under such an element of SL2Z. And we want to show that lambda tau and lambda tau dash, they are homotetic. Then simply we take C tau plus D. If we multiply, let is lambda tau dash by C tau plus D. We'll see that we are getting Z of A tau plus B plus Z of C tau plus D. And clearly, this A and C are co-prime and B and D are co-prime. So if we take all these integral multiples and take combinations, we'll be covering basically Z tau plus Z, which is lambda tau. So certainly, if two upper half elements are in the same SL to Z orbit, they will give us homothetic lattices. And conversely, suppose we have two homothetic lattices. Okay, suppose we have lambda tau and lambda tau dash. Suppose they are homothetic. Then there will be some complex number alpha, such that alpha times lambda tau dash is lambda tau. And what do we want to show? We want to show that tau dash is uh, some uh, image of SL2Z. I mean, SL2Z acting on tau. And that can also be easily seen because if alpha lambda tau dash is lambda tau, certainly alpha times tau dash is a tau plus b, and alpha times one is c tau plus d. And what are these a, b, c, d? They are a, b, c, d. They are integers of determinant a, d minus b, c plus minus one, because it is not that just alpha times lambda tau dash is contained in lambda tau, but in fact it is equality. That means this a b c d they they will have to satisfy this a d minus b c is plus minus one okay but if we take the if we divide alpha tau prime by alpha we'll find that tau prime is a tau plus b by c tau plus d and the only question is whether the determinant could be minus one but that can be ruled out because we know that the imaginary part of tau and tau dash, uh, imaginary part of tau and tau dash, they are both positive. So certainly negative determinant is ruled out. So, so in other words, what we get is that this is the set of representatives of homothetic classes of lattices. It is upper half plane quotiented by SL to Z. Okay. So elliptic curves up to isomorphism over C is represented by an element on this uh, in this quotient. And one can refine this further that suppose we want elliptic curve with a given subgroup of order N. Suppose we are talking about isomorphism class of an elliptic curve with a given subgroup of order N. So it's like a pair, E comma C, okay? And two such pairs will be isomorphic if E gets mapped to E1 and C gets mapped to C1, okay? So that kind of pair. So this will be represented for this, the lattice will be of this form and then the quotient space will be, or the representatives will be H mod gamma naught of N, okay? Where gamma naught N is the congruent subgroup that is already mentioned, like you have uh, element in SL to Z, such that C is congruent to zero mod N. In other words, this quotient, H mod gamma naught of N, it represents isomorphism class of pairs 
consisting of an elliptic curve and a subgroup of order n. And this quotient actually has the structure of an algebraic curve. Uh, known, uh, this curve is known as modular curve and one can compactify it. So how does one compactify it? Like we'll have to take the, uh, eight the cusps okay, and the rational points and you take the quotient. So what we get is this X naught of N and this X naught of N is a compact Riemann surface or it's a modular curve. It's also known as modular curve. And it is defined by polynomials with rational coefficients. Okay, so as an application, let me uh, let me show an application of this association. Okay, so let's consider isomorphism class consisting of pairs E and P. So what is an what is this E? E is of course an elliptic curve, and what is P? It's a point of order n on that elliptic curve. And if we think in terms of lattice, this corresponding lattice, it is like lambda tau and one by n plus lambda tau. Okay. And such the homothetic class of this lattice, it is represented by H quotiented by gamma one of n. Okay, because we'll see that this gamma one of n preserves that. Okay, so so this gamma one n is a subgroup is a congruent subgroup where C is congruent to zero mod N and A and D are congruent to one mod N. Okay. So for example, suppose we want to consider whether there exist elliptic curves which uh, over Q with point of order 11 or whether there's a point on the, well, whether uh, Z mod 11 can appear as torsion subgroup for an elliptic curve over Q. So to address this question, uh, this question, we can look at this uh, modular curve because we can look at X1 of 11, okay? And this X1 of 11, it's, uh, we already know that it's an algebraic, uh, I mean, we know it's uh, equation, okay? Of course, I mean, I mean, I can refer to Diamond's book for all these details, some of these details, that is modular curves, they have, they are defined by equations with rational coefficients. They are defined by polynomial equations with rational coefficients. But for X1, 11 is particularly simple. That X1 of 11, it turns out to be an elliptic curve, which is Y square plus Y equal to X cube minus X. Okay. Then what we want to do, we want to show because our purpose will be served if we can show that y111 has no rational point. Then our conclusion would be that there will be no elliptic curve defined over Q with point of order 11. Okay. So to do that, it's easy to find the points on this elliptic curve because this has rank zero and this has only five points and they are all cusps meaning they do not belong to Y111. They came only due to this compactification. Okay, so these points actually are not there in the uh, Y111, whose points actually represent these isomorphism classes. So in other words, our conclusion would be that there is no elliptic curve over Q with a point of order 11. Similarly, so why are there, uh, I mean, like in Mazur's theorem, we saw that there are infinitely many elliptic curves over Q with uh, torsion points of order, like one, two, three, four, five, up to 10, except 11, but again, 12, okay, so those. So for that, what we have to observe is just X1 of N. Then one can check that for N, equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Of course, 11 does not work, but again, take 12. Then it turns out that X1 has genus 0. So genus 0 means it has infinitely many rational points. Okay. So that means there are infinitely many elliptic curves over Q with torsion of this uh, of these orders. Okay. So so maybe I'll just summarize now in the last uh, five minutes, maybe I have, or is it, okay, so 
yeah so so let me just summarize quickly that what we did in the final part of this second lecture is that elliptic curves we can associate with a lattice and that association will be at the level of isomorphism classes if we take homothetic lattices okay so that elliptic curves over c they are like upper half plane quotient by sl to z because upper half plane quotient by sl to z they give us the classes of homothetic lattices okay and with that one can actually study the torsion structure of elliptic curves over q or in fact naiman and these uh, collaborators they have ruled out certain torsion subgroups for elliptic curves defined over quadratic extensions or cubic extensions and some other that is the way actually that uh, this is quite effective quite useful particularly useful when the corresponding modular curve it uh, the point uh, like if you can easily calculate those points or if it has finitely many points then the corresponding torsion group will only appear finitely many for finitely many elliptic curves like that okay, so yeah so this can be uh quite i mean it this can be exploited so i guess i will come i will i mean okay so yeah these are the additional references apart from the books that i already mentioned that uh, books by silverman this rational point on elliptic curves as well as arithmetic of elliptic curves and milne's book apart from that this first course in modular forms by diamond and schumann for this uh, this modular space of elliptic curves which is explained there and in particular for x0 of 11 and x1 of 11 i refer to okay sorry there's a typo here i refer to tom weston's uh, online notes okay. so yeah so i'll stop here uh that is there are two questions uh did you unmute yourself and ask the question um there were two raised hands but i uh, but now they're not there anymore Maybe if you don't mind, I could ask a question about the morning. Do you know if Merrill's theorem is uh, um, effective? This N D that you had in Merrill's theorem. The... Yeah, I think, as far as I know, it's not very effective. I think it is too large. But yeah, but yeah, I'll not be able to comment uh, more on that. But yeah, I think uh, hard in lectures that it is not so effective. Uh, I think the first question by Shyam is. uh could you clarify what the suffixes to y and x mean sorry uh, let me uh, sorry i did not get the question let me open the chat box if possible okay yeah so what was the question actually oh this suffixes y and x mean uh, okay which one do you mean let me just go back to the slides for oh, x1 okay so this one is like for this gamma 1 n so because we have this congruent subgroup mm, we have this okay so okay so one question is about this calling it one so that's because we are using this gamma 1 of n where like we apart from c being congruent to zero mod n we also insist that a and d are congruent to one mod n so this is whereas this uh, x uh, okay now i got the point okay sorry yeah so and this uh, gamma not of n this uh, y not this is like because we are only insisting on c being congruent to zero mod n so that's like because this, because of this congruent subgroup when this subgroup is gamma not of n we are denoting it by y not of n and x not of n and if you are taking the other congruent subgroup gamma 1 of n it is y1 and x1 and as for y and x yeah so it is before compactification because uh, like uh, uh, what we are doing so here here you can see the difference that here the upper half plane together with infinity and the rational points okay so all this uh, together we are taking and then quotienting out it's like the compactification and this Uh, again one can refer to uh, diamond's book diamond and schumann's book so it is all explained there that how 
this is uh, this modular curves are convectified um, there was also one question by sunil kumar uh, is it possible for two elliptic curves to be defined over a number field uh, be isomorphic over the complex numbers but not be isomorphic over the number field yeah yeah it is certainly possible yeah like is quadratic twists of elliptic curves are there other questions for anupam that you would want to ask uh, yes there's one raised hand by manudi um, you you could unmute yourself and ask the question so sir i have a question that uh, so if i take the standard lattice in c that is just uh, just unit box and then i can rotate it by identity uh, that i using multiplying by i just rotate it by 90 degree so then the lattice become same but uh, but the then so these lattice should not define a elliptic curve of non cm right it this should be a cm elliptic curve yeah i think this will be a cm elliptic curve yeah it will be like yes. complex multiplication by i yes okay just that's question yeah so usually what we get is like uh, for most lattices if alpha uh, alpha of lambda tau is lambda tau so that happens for i mean mm. i mean alpha of uh, sorry alpha lambda tau is contained in lambda tau and usually alpha is an integer but for some special types we get even for non integers and those are precisely the cases of complex multiplication in fact i am going to mention it in my lecture tomorrow because when we talk about analytic continuation of l function of course it is known for modular elliptic curves but that works only over q but over general number field we don't get analytic continuation of hasseway l function except in the case of complex multiplication so in that context uh, like any anyway, while talk a little bit about elliptic curve with complex multiplication and of course kurzweil's theorem i mean that is this bsd for elliptic curve with complex multiplication uh, with a point of infinite order that also yeah requires this theory of complex multiplication so yeah i'll briefly mention it tomorrow's lecture also does q rational point on x1 and correspond to q rational elliptic curve with q rational n torsion point yeah yeah q rational point on x1 and corresponds to an isomorphism class of q rational elliptic curve with q rational n torsion point does non zero genus no actually in fact genus if genus gets bigger because we had this uh, models conjecture proved by fall things that genus 1 and genus 0 you may have infinitely many points but if you have genus 2 or higher you have only finitely many points okay so of course zena 0 gives you more, more i mean yeah so you have uh, too many points if zena is 0 but even zena 1 you may get infinitely many points because you may you'll be getting an elliptic curve but higher zena you'll get uh, only finitely many rational points i mean the question is whether x not of n uh, non zero zena will imply Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I understood it a little bit wrong. Yeah. But genus one also, you may have infinitely many points. Yeah. But I should say genus bigger than strictly bigger than one, certainly finitely many rational points. And I again like you should look at the note by Tom Winston, which is available at his website. So it has explained the, all these things in detail, particularly x not of eleven and x one of eleven, explicitly. what are the cusps and all and how do you get the equations of these modular curves for that one can refer to diamond and schumann's book uh if there are no more questions uh let's thank anupam again